And saints, uh, friends and family, uh, those who are uh, with us through Facebook Live, we want you to know we are certainly appreciative of your presence and we pray that you have a copy of God's divine word as we study uh, and see uh, uh, the things that God has revealed to, to us in his word uh, that we might learn some principles for us, our lives today uh, as we uh, look into the pages of inspiration. Now, what we are doing is a uh, biblical study. We are in the book of Exodus. And so we are um, doing a surface study of Exodus, getting a 15,000 foot view uh, of the book and uh, uh, drawing some application to our lives as we are um, becoming um, mindful of things that perhaps we have studied before uh, and looking at it with a fresh, uh, fresh vision. So on tonight, uh, we are in the book of Exodus, as we mentioned, chapter number 12. Exodus family, chapter uh, number 12. On last week, uh, we looked at uh, the Passover that God had instituted. Uh, we've been looking at the uh, plagues, uh, and God was telling uh, Pharaoh through his servant Moses, uh, to let my people go and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And so we looked at a lot of different aspects of that and how God uh, on many occasions made a distinction between God's folk uh, and the Egyptians. And But none of that made a difference to uh, Pharaoh whose heart was hardened uh, up to the 10th plague uh, where uh, the death angel would uh, destroy the firstborn of every household that was not covered uh, by the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. And on last week, uh, we looked at the instructions that God gave to the children of Israel, uh, a lamb of the first year, and they were to take it on the 10th, keep it to the 14th. They were to uh, eat the meal uh, with bitter herbs and have a staff in the hand, belt on their waist, sandals on their feet. And, and all of this was part of God's instructions uh, as it relates to each household as they observe the instituted Passover. Uh, and when the death angel would come and he would see the blood, he would pass over that particular house. And so this is where uh, we are in Exodus chapter number 12. And I'd like for us to look down around verse number 29. Uh, in Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 29, the Bible says, and it came to pass when at midnight, that the Lord struck all the firstborn uh, in the land of Egypt. So this took place at midnight. It is dark at midnight. A lot of times we look at uh, movies and uh, they have depictions of uh, the children of Israel uh, leaving uh, 400 plus years, 430 years of Egyptian bondage and it's sunny outside. It looks like uh, it's around noon, but the Bible lets us know that it's at midnight. It's in the middle of the night, and we're going to see uh, their exodus and, and what all took place there and how that's relevant. So the Bible lets us know from the firstborn, verse 29, uh, of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was uh, in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose when? In the night. Uh, he and all his servants, all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And so this is the straw that broke the camel's back. And so now uh, Pharaoh is positioned and ready and uh, it, it, to just release God's people. Uh, he gave some conditions uh, a couple of times. Uh, prior. You can leave, but you can't leave with everybody. You can leave, but you can't go far and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but God said, no conditions whatsoever. Let my people go. And so now uh, Pharaoh is motivated. Uh, the plague had touched his house uh, in a very personal way. And matter of fact, uh, God mentioned this uh, at the beginning of this journey uh, to Moses uh, in chapter number four, and verse number 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my uh, firstborn, my son, my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, 
I will kill your son, your firstborn. And so these are the bookends. It's the beginning uh, of the warning via the plagues. And, and here we are uh, where the 10th plague has been uh, uh, ushered and uh, Pharaoh's firstborn son has died. Now, in verse number 31 of chapter number 12, the Bible says, then he called for Moses and Aaron. When did he call for Moses and Aaron? He called for them at night, the Bible says, and said, rise and go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And so he was fed up uh, with uh, God's people. And he just said, it's time for you to be gone. Uh, but then he says something interesting. He says, and bless me also. Isn't it interesting how the devil always want a blessing? And so here's Pharaoh. And Pharaoh finally uh, realizes that he can't contend with the Almighty. And so he releases God's people, uh, tells them be gone immediately, uh, evicted. And he's going to drive them actually out. Uh, and then he has the audacity to say, and bless me also. In verse number um, uh, 33, uh, and the Egyptians urged the people. So not only was Pharaoh fed up uh, with Israel, the Egyptians were fed up with Israel. Their life was made miserable uh, trying to keep God's uh, covenant people. And so they urged the people uh, uh, to leave. And, and the Bible says that they may send them out uh, of the land in Haste, don't leave later on and not at noon, uh, not when the sun rises up. Get your stuff and get out right now. And so this is uh, the, the urgency uh, that we see here in the text. Uh, and, th and then they were terrified for they said, uh, we shall all be dead. In other words, if y'all don't go, we, you know, we, we will all be dead. Verse 34, so the people took their dough before it was leavened, uh, having their kneading bowl bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. So they are running out almost like hobos. Just take all your stuff, uh, fold it up and, and just get out. And Moses had told them ahead of time, you know, uh, put your belt on, put your sandals, uh, amen, on your feet and, and be ready. Eat that meal because when this death angel comes through, uh, you're going to be ushered out. And when you look at chapter number 11 and verse number one, look at chapter number 11 and verse number one, look at what God uh, tells Moses. He says, and, and, and the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague, he says, on Pharaoh and on Egypt. He says, afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely what? Drive you out of here all together. And so here it is in the middle of the night and Pharaoh is not wasting time. Get these folk out of here. The Egyptians are not wasting time. Get them out of here or we all going to die. And so we see the sense of urgency uh, for them to leave in that the, the dough, the, the bread uh, did not have time uh, to rise. And so the people took their dough. Uh, before it was leavened and in verse number 34 uh, of chapter number 12. And so, of course, we, we talk about uh, unleavened bread, uh, all right, uh, and the Passover instituted, uh, uh, you know, by, by the unleavened uh, bread. Always remember uh, about God's great deliverance and how God's folk uh, were ushered out uh, of Egypt with haste. Uh, in verse number 35, the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses and they asked uh, from the Egyptians articles of silver, uh, articles of gold and clothing. Uh, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. And so when God's folk left, they left with reparations. They grabbed everything they could. They grabbed silver. They grabbed gold. Uh, they grabbed uh, wealthy garments and all kinds of stuff. So when they were leaving, uh, they were not leaving empty handed. And I like where the Bible says uh, that they plundered 
the Egyptians, took your earrings, took your nose ring, took your ne necklace, your bracelet, took everything, and they were gone. When you look over in Genesis chapter uh, number 15 and verse number 14, Genesis chapter 15 and verse number uh, 14, uh, listen to your Bible. This is what God tells uh, his servant Abraham or Abram uh, about the days that would come. Uh, and so he said in verse 14, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. He says, afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. And so even before God's people uh, entered into Egyptian bondage, God was telling Abram uh, the end of the story that they're going to be enslaved for 400 some odd years. But when they when I deliver them out, um, they're going to leave with great possessions. And all of this was even before um, they went to Egypt uh, in the first place. And so uh, the Egyptians were plundered. Now, in verse number 37 of Exodus uh, chapter number 12, uh, the Bible lets us know that about 600,000 men uh, on foot beside uh, children. And so uh, 600 plus men, uh, scholars uh, estimate that uh, it was two and a half million of God's people that were leaving out of Egypt. That's a whole lot of folk. And so when we talked about um, God's folk, when they went to Egypt, they were 66 persons. Uh, and then they began to multiply. And as they multiplied, the Egyptians feared because there were more of them than they were the Egyptians. And as you all remember, uh, the Pharaoh at that time began to afflict them. Uh, put taskmasters over them, and the more that they afflicted them, uh, the more that the nation of Israel multiplied. So leaving out uh, of 430 years of bondage, uh, you got two and a half million of God's people. Now that's a whole lot of folk uh, leaving Egypt. And so uh, when we look in verse number 38 of Exodus chapter number 12, not only did they leave, but the Bible says, a mixed multitude went up with them also. This mixed multitude might be other Gentile slaves, uh, and it may be some of the Egyptians as well that saw the miracles and converted or over there uh, with the Jews and left with them. So it was the Jewish nation, God's people, the nation of Israel, and also a mixed multitude. Some other folk uh, went with them out of uh, Egypt. And so that's very important for us uh, to recognize as well. Now, um, in Numbers chapter 11 and verse number four, Numbers chapter 11 and verse number four, because Numbers 11 and verse number four, um, listen to your Bible, because this mis mixed multitude caused problems for the children of Israel. Numbers 11 and verse number what did I say? Four. Um, yeah, four, 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 four. Yes, that's exactly what I want. Uh, verse four, listen to your Bible. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to the intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat uh, to eat? Look at verse number one. Verse number one, they got in trouble with God. Uh, the Bible says, now, when the people complained, uh, now all this was incited by the mixed multitude, these other folk that went with God's folk. And now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses. Uh, and when Moses prayed, uh, to the Lord, the, the fire was uh, quenched. Uh, and then, of course, you see in verse number four, the mix, mixed multitude, they yielded. So, um, so this group that came with God's folk, uh, they were problematic, not to say that God's folk were not, um, but they were problematic to them uh, later on down the line. And so when we go back to Exodus chapter number 12, uh, the Bible says in verse number 39, uh, then they, they baked unleavened cakes uh, of the dough which they had uh, brought out of Egypt, for it was not 
leavened. Why? Because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait. You, they couldn't wait for the bread to finish rising, uh, to rise. Uh, and so um, unleavened bread uh, really reminded them of the urgency and it reminded them of God's great deliverance and how they had to grab everything they had and fold up their clothes, throw it over their shoulder and get out of uh, Egypt. And so, uh, again, we're talking about unleavened bread and all of the Passover and the other feasts reminded them of the great hand of the Lord uh, delivering them. And so in verse 41, we have specifically uh, how long they were in Egypt. Listen to verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years on that uh, very same day, it came to pass all the armies of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. So later on uh, or earlier, when you see they were in there 400 years, uh, that's approximate. Now we're getting more down to the specifics and they're saying that God's folk uh, were in bondage for 430. 30 years. So sometimes when you see number figures in the Bible, uh, those are rounded off numbers. And so, uh, for instance, when we talked about uh, the soldiers there uh, in verse number 37, 600,000 men. Is it 600,001? Is it 600,010? You know, so a lot of times we get round off numbers. And then later on, uh, in other passages, maybe the Chronicles or other verses, we get more specific numbers. So when you see uh, numbers 600, 1,000, and th a lot of times we have to understand that those were approximations. And so uh, we see that God's people were there 430 years. All right. Now, uh, when you drop down to verse number 48, in verse 48, Exodus chapter number 12, uh, the Bible says, uh, and when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land uh, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So when you circumcise, you have converted over uh, to the uh, the beliefs, the convictions, uh, the uh, the faith of God's people. Verse forty nine. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So God says, well, I'm not going to have a law for them and a law for you. You're going to have one law. And so when we talk about proselytes, uh, those that converted over to Judaism. Um, uh, rejecting the idolatry of their own land and their own worship and all of that kind of stuff and wanted to dwell with God's people. Uh, they had to be circumcised and they had to live as Jews folk. Uh, and if they did that, then they can observe the Passover and they were subject to the same laws as God's folk. So God said one law for everybody, the stranger as well as the native born. Now, when we look over in chapter number 13 and verse number one, I want to call that to your attention because I think that that's important to understand. Uh, God speaks about uh, the consecration of the firstborn, 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 firstborn. Uh, verse number one, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, uh, saying what? Consecrate to me all the what? Firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel both of man and beast, it is mine. So God considered the firstborn to belong to him. The firstborn is mine, all right? Uh, and so whether it be uh, animal, whether it be man or whether it be beast, uh, the firstborn uh, uh, belong uh, to God. Now, uh, look, if you will, let me get a reader at Genesis 49 and 3. Genesis 49 and 3. Let me get another reader to get Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. So the first one is Genesis 49 and 3. Uh, the second one is Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Uh, and so I need two readers, and we want to start with the Genesis passage. Uh, if we can get a good, loud, uh, clear reading of that, that'll, that'll help us out. So Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 3. What does your Bible read? Okay. It, 
Ruben, you are my firstborn. My, my might is the beginning of my strength. The excellence of dignity and the excellence of power. Good, good, good. So, so, so here is uh, Jacob or Israel, and he's speaking about the firstborn, which was Reuben. And so he says, you are my firstborn, my uh, might and the beginning of my strength. Uh, so the firstborn, uh, like first fruits, is considered the best. And so God says, consecrate that to me. Your best belongs to God. Um, let me get somebody to get that second passage. Thank you so much, Sister Tomsina. Uh, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. What does your Bible read? All right. And, thank you very much. Honor the Lord. Uh, the Bible says with your possessions, but not any. Of that. And then he says, and with the first fruits of all your increase. God said, I want the best. I, I want it off the top. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, when it comes to giving, uh, do we give from the gross or do we give from the net? Always give God the best. Give it from the gross. You know, uh, you know, when, you know, the only reason you got a net is because they take out of the gross before it even hits your pocket. But give to the Lord your very best. And so he says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So that so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. When it comes to God, God wants your best and, and not what's uh, left. And so uh, that's the principle that I think is important uh, just to emphasize. Let's go back to uh, Genesis chapter number 13. In Genesis chapter number 13, as we matriculate on through uh, Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus uh, chapter number 13. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can get to chapter 19. We'll see how all that goes. Uh, but look at verse number 17, uh, Exodus 13 and verse number 17. Listen to uh, your Bible. The Bible says, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way uh, uh, of the land of the Philistines, although that that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the uh, wilderness of the Red Sea. And so what we have here is God uh, 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 causing uh, the great exodus and then leading them in the direction that they should go. And it's important that we understand that God always knows what's best for us. And so God is leading them by the way of the wilderness and for them, that was best for them. Why? They weren't ready to go the short route. They weren't ready to go from here straight to there. Uh, and so God knows what's best for our lives. So when you're going through trouble trials and tribulations, uh, just, just understand that God knows what's best for you. And I'll, I'll emphasize uh, another part, uh, another point along the same lines uh, in chapter number uh, 15. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but the point is that God led them and he led them into the wilderness. And so um, that's where they were going to be tested in all these kinds of things. Drop down to verse number 21, Exodus 13, 21. Uh, and the Lord went before them. How did God go before them? God was leading the way uh, by uh, in a pillar of cloud uh, to lead them, uh, to lead the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. God was leading his people. Chapter number 14 and verse number eight. Chapter 14 and verse number eight. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of, e of Israel. So he let them go. And then he says, uh-uh, I ain't letting these folk go. Get right back here. Uh, and so here he comes pursuing God's people as they get to the precipice of uh, the Red Sea. And the Bible uh, lets us know in verse, uh, number, um, uh, verse number 10, 
uh, last sentence in verse number 10. So they were very afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Verse number 11. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, uh, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? And so they were terrified of Pharaoh. They saw all of the plagues that God wrought on uh, Egypt and, and they knew that God was with them. But soon as it got difficult, they said, why did you deliver us? We were better in Egypt. Oh, God's going to kill us. Listen, God, if God be for you, who can be against you? We really have to learn how to trust in God. Here's God's people with no measure of faith in God, although they saw the plagues uh, and they saw the working of the hand, the finger of God toward their enemy. And yet they were still more afraid of their enemy than they were uh, of fearing the Lord or giving reverence unto God. And so this is a lesson for us today. Uh, so Moses says in verse number 13, we're very much familiar uh, he said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see what the salvation of the Lord. He lets them know that the Egyptians that you see today, you're not going to see them no more. Uh, and then uh, the Lord said uh, uh, to, to, to Moses, um, verse number 15, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to uh, go forward. Uh, but lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. All right. So this is taking place and uh, this didn't happen. So immediate drop down to verse number 19. Let's get a biblical view of the events that took place with this great deliverance uh, in Exodus. In verse number 19, the Bible says, and the angel of God, all right, uh, who went up before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. Uh, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came uh, between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud of darkness uh, to one and it gave light by night to the other so that one did not come near the other all that night. So that night God was dividing uh, the waters. And so Israel had light, but it was dark. Uh, where the Egyptians were approaching them. It's such a powerful passage. And so he divided the waters. We know that on the left and the right and, and commanded uh, Israel to go through. And the Bible says on dry land. Now, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, uh, Paul describes this same event uh, very uniquely as a baptism. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 1, Paul says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were, here come, baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so Christ, we see even in the Old Testament, where we read earlier, uh, the angel of uh, God in Exodus uh, 14 and verse number 19, we're talking about Christ, even in the Old Testament, you know, and so we see the pre-incarnate uh, son of the living God before he came in the flesh. God, Jesus always existed. There was never a time that he did not exist. He was with God's people. As a matter of fact, when they had a, a great debate between the Jews and, um, and, and Jesus, and, and uh, Jesus told them in John 8 that before Abraham was, I am. And so where God told Moses uh, to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, and Moses says, who shall I say uh, uh, sent me? God said, tell him I am sent you. And so the pre-incarnate son of the living God was always in existence before he was born of a virgin, before uh, he dawned on flesh and, uh, and lived among us as a man, being all man and all God, all at the same time. And so you know the story. We're still in Exodus chapter number 14. Uh, and, and in verse number 25 is very interesting. For the Bible says, uh, and he took off their chariot reels. So after Israel goes through, 
Here come the Egyptians. They want to pursue them even through the Red Sea. Dry land, water here, water there. They saw the plagues. God is obviously for them and not for us. And yet they go through, uh, amen, to pursue them. And so uh, as they were pursuing God's people, he doesn't let them get close enough to them. He's taken off their chariot wheels. And so the Bible says, uh, amen, so they drove, uh, so that they drove them with great, with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Long story short, uh, God closed the walls uh, and all of the Egyptians died uh, in that Red Sea. Verse 28, uh, then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, not so much as one of them remained. And so, um, uh, and that's Pharaoh too. Uh, and so a lot of times we see movies on TV and, and those movies are very impactful. Most of us are visual learners. And so a lot of times what people um, know about the Bible outside of reading uh, is a false notion of uh, it's not accurate as it relates to the word of God. And so, you know, I've seen some movies where Pharaoh saw the water close and he runs away. I've seen movies, uh, Noah with, um, I can't remember what that guy's name is. Um, uh, it's it, it's the, the story Noah and, and they had stowaways. Uh, oh, who? Is that is that the guy he also played in the gal uh, the 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 gladiator? Is that Russell Crowe? Crow. There you go. All right. Uh, so Russell Crowe played in the movie Noah, and in the movie Noah there were stowaways on Noah's Ark and all this, you know. And so when we see Hollywood depictions, uh, just know that that's not the truth. This is, and, and some is so far from the truth in Scripture that it, it shouldn't even air in the first place. It, you know, it's, it's just a shame. So make sure that we understand uh, the, you know, truth from error and we find truth in the word of God. Okay, so um, verse 31 is important. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And so what's interesting is sometimes people believe for a while. They believe when uh, the storm is over. Uh, they believe when the victory is won. But when things get difficult in their life, then oftentimes people go back to doubting God. Is God for me? Has God not seen what's going on in my life? Um, is God punishing me for something? And so um, we are not so much different than uh, those of old who um, we're reading about that oftentimes you look and you say, how could they do that? Well, um, sometimes we do the same things. And I'll give us an example of that. Now, um, the, in chapter number 15, I got you, Kuhn. In chapter number 15, they begin to sing a song. Uh, and this is a big old song. And uh, I mean, I mean, they are, they are praising God for delivering them out of Egyptian bondage. They finally have left Egypt and now it's time to celebrate. And so um, I say that to say this, that after great victories in our life, a lot of times there's great testing right after it. So you won a battle and then you, you face another one. And so um, we have to be mindful of that. And I'm going to show us that in, in the text. Uh, Brother Kuhn, yes, sir. Impossible with God. 
Yeah. I mean, if you've never gone through anything in your life, if you know you've been like the uh, the rich young ruler, mm-hmm. you've uh, you know uh, obeyed the ten commandments, you gave to the poor and everything else, uh, uh, you don't really weigh uh, how much God has done for you in your life. So I'm thinking that you know when these people went through and saw what they saw, you know God always had their back. I mean, God had done some miraculous signs. Maybe they didn't see the miracles because they were in Goshen while the Egyptians were going through the stuff. But, you know, knowing that God has always uh, has your back, if you're faithful to him and committed to him, uh, just, I'm just saying you know, keep your conviction in God uh, because you're still fighting, you're still living, and you're definitely still sinning. But God is always available to forgive you of your sin. So... Uh, just say that is, you know, when you've gone through what you've gone through, don't give in so easily because God is has done so much for each and every one of us. I appreciate that, Brother Coon, and that's very important for us to remember because um, we have uh, short-term memory. You know, uh, we have selective memory, um, and what's interesting is we can't see the future, and we forget the past. God has been with you in the past. And so now that you're up against another trial, uh, a lot of times we act like, where's God? Uh, How's it going to turn out? And you forget the last 10, 12, 15, 30 times that God delivered you from trials in the past. And so the reason we're studying what we're studying in Exodus, Genesis, is because of what we read in Romans 15 and 4, those things that were written before were written for our learning. And so we have to learn. We, we, we ought not repeat the same mistakes that they did. Uh, and so we should uh, learn from those things that were written aforetime. When you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 further down, it talks, about, it talks about that. They did this, don't do that, and all those kinds of things. Not only that, but James chapter number 1 and verse Uh, Number two, my brethren, count it all joy, not if, but he says, when uh, you fall in various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. They were tested and we are going to be tested, but we should pass the test. We should keep the faith and trust God even when you can't trace him. You need to trust him. And so that's vitally important. Uh, Brother Kuhn, is that you? Yes, sir. Yeah, man. I just feel like God was with them in the pillar and the fire. It kind of reminds me of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Mm-hmm. God was with them. They were not by themselves in that situation. And sometimes we don't think that, you know, God's with us because we can't see him. But we always have to know that he's there. And every trial, God is with you in your trial. I mean, we got to look at it and see that God is in the trial with us. We're not going through the trial ourselves. You know, we got to see what God is trying to do in our lives through the trial because you know, every trial is not bad. We just got to take the, the good out of the trial and, 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 do, uh, and use it in our spiritual walk. My fa- our daily walk. That's right. Yeah, no, that's, that's good, brother. That, that's good, brother. We got to learn to learn the lesson. Um, in, in Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6, favorite verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Uh, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. God doesn't tell us to understand everything, but he says, trust him. And that's what we need to do. Trust him. Um, our Bible study, what was that? Uh, Monday, we were talking about faith. Uh, and how from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God required faith. And, and so we have to understand that God is working in our lives. He's doing some stuff. Uh, and so what we have to do, instead of trying to understand what, what God is doing, we need to trust that God is uh, working on our behalf. You know, Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord to the called according to his purpose. So if you know that even this bad thing is working for my good, just trust it and and hold on to God's unchanging hand. So we got to weather the storm. Now, 
Uh, when we look, oh, Sister Thomasina, yes, ma'am. But like you said, we have to walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, ma'am. If you can't see what's going on, you got to believe in it. That's you right. The real faith come in if you cannot see it. Absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. Uh, now, let's let's take a look really quickly. So they're singing the song in Exodus chapter uh, 15. Um, uh, let's see here. Verse 21. So Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed uh, gloriously. Um, the horse and its rider has uh, thrown into the sea. So, I mean, uh, this whole chapter 15, uh, all up to 21 is, is a song. Uh, and they are rejoicing uh, for God's great deliverance. Now, watch this, verse 22, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Uh, then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and find no water. So now they're out of Egypt. Three days, and all of a sudden, their faith falters. Three days. Ain't even been a week since they've been out of Egypt. They just finished singing the song. And all of a sudden, where's God? Now, and so the Bible says, now when they came to uh, Mara, uh, meaning bitter, uh, they could not drink the waters of Mara for they were bitter. Uh, therefore, uh, the name of it was called Mara. Same thing as Naomi. Naomi said, don't call me Naomi, which is pleasant. Call me Mara when she came back from Moab. Now, verse 24, and the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Here it comes. So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. And when they cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There uh, he made, where? there he made a statue and an ordinance for them. And there, here it comes, he tested them. Uh, so God was testing his people. And, and what's the test? Here, here's, here's the idea that God uh, has a purpose for your pain. And so we talk about all things work together for the good. Understand that now, all things. And so when life is painful, when life is uncomfortable, uh, when life is confusing, just know that we still got to trust God and know that even though you're going through something negative, God said all things work together for the good. He didn't say it was good, but it's going to work for the good. So God has a purpose for your pain. And, and so here they are three days out of, out of um, Egypt and they go to and they see a body of water and they cannot drink it. And the first thing, oh my goodness, where is God? And they complained against Moses. And the Bible clearly lets us know that God was testing them. And as God tested them, God tests us as well. And so you have the picture here, uh, cut down a tree, throw a tree into the waters, and the bitter waters became sweet. Isn't it, isn't it the same thing that God did on the cross? Uh, amen. He, 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 amen. He put his son on the cross in the midst of this bitter and nasty and fallen world uh, and this uh, ugly world, this fallen world, this nasty world, uh, this evil world uh, is made sweet by the tree uh, with Christ on it. And so uh, when God uh, enters into your life, uh, when Jesus is in your life, he can make the bitter waters sweet again. And so the Bible lets us know when you read a little bit further that they went a little bit further to a place called Elam, uh, in verse number 27, uh, where there were 12 wells of water. Who dug the wells? Where did the wells come from? So they're in a place called Edom, uh, uh, Elam, and, and there happens to be, here comes that number, 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And so all of a sudden, they have an oasis in uh, this desert, this wilderness land. A and there's water for two and a half million people. Won't God do it? Or won't he deliver you? 
Uh, someone said that if God uh, bring you to it, he'll bring you through it. And so we've got to learn how to trust in God. Uh, and you can trust them even though you can't trace them. And, and so we have to learn. And, and you need to be, when you pray, you ask the Lord, increase my faith. Because you're going to be tested in this life. Uh, and a lot of times we have tests that we haven't run up uh, upon before. This is a new test. This ain't a familiar one that I keep failing. This is a new trial. This is a new situation. And, and you ain't ready for this one. You haven't seen this one. And, and so you don't know what you're going to be up against the rest of this night. You don't know what you're going to be up against uh, first thing in the morning. And so we need to be ever careful, ever mindful that this life is full of tests. And tests are designed to draw us near God, uh, and to trust in God. Uh, but ask God to increase your faith. And that's very important for us to understand. Uh, now then, time check. How are we doing? Ten. Ten minutes. Oh, I'm doing good. Okay, now, chapter number 16. In chapter number 16, here comes another test. In verse number one, and they journeyed from Elam. They had the 70 palm trees, 12 wells. Uh, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. So they left the wilderness of Shur, S H U R, uh, and they and they went to Elam, E L I M, and now they're in the wilderness of Sin, S I N, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month. So two and a half months since Egypt, here they are, and the Bible lets us know in verse number two. Here it come again. The, the whole, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complain. I want us to understand that God don't like complaining. God, God does not like complaining. And a lot of times we don't think uh, complaining is a sin. We, we don't think complaining is a sin. Sometimes we just complain because it's entertaining and it's therapy for me. I don't know why, why they, they can't get the paycheck on time. I don't know why this and I don't know why. They, and these people need to get, see, complaining is a sin. Uh, turn to, uh, when you get a chance, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse uh, number uh, 9 and 10. The Bible says, uh, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by a serpent. Verse 10, here it comes. 1 Corinthians 10 and 10, he says, nor complain as some of them also complain and were destroyed by the destroyer. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times we say, oh, God don't like ugly. God don't like ugly. Well, God don't like sin. And, and complaining is sin. Complaining is ugly. And so what we have to do, is we have to learn to trust in God. Too often time, everybody got to complain. Everybody got something that, that, that rubbed them the wrong way, make them itch and and, and, you know, you just want to say something and you want to, you know, so you, we got to be mindful about how you use this mouth that God has given you. Uh, so, so we ought not complain. We ought to be more prayerful. Um, and so here they are two and, uh, two months, two and a half, uh, two months and 15 days out of Egypt. And they complaining again. They just finished complaining in chapter number 15 and God gave them 12 wells and 70 palm trees. Now, uh, here they go again, and they say at the latter part, part of verse number three, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. So you mean to tell me God going to spend all this time delivering his people from uh, Egyptian bondage so that they can die in the wilderness. But see, this is their mentality. Uh, and so, um, you know, what's interesting is when you're in the world, you don't be complaining. You know, you, you're in the world and it seems like everything. But as soon as you come into church, now you got complaints about everything. As soon as, soon as you become a child of God, now you got all these complaints. But when you're on that job and they had you working 12 hours a day uh, and eight days a week, you ain't complaining about nothing. And when they ask you to come in early, yes, sir, boss, I'll be there. No problem. No problem at all. But as soon as you come out of the world and and now you're serving the Lord and all kinds of stuff now. Uh, the goodness of God is working in your life. Now you complain about every little thing. We have to be mindful, uh, amen, that, that, that God, uh, you know, God don't like complaining. Somebody's got their hand up. Oh, Brother Manson, yes, sir. Yes, if you go to Numbers uh, chapter 11, verse 1, mm -hmm. he's saying uh, he gets anger when you do complain. Uh, absolutely. That's where the fire burned, right? That's where the fire burned among God's people. Thank you, brother. 
for that same uh, complaining. Uh, and so now when the people complain, thank you, my brother, it displeased the Lord and fire came out. Appreciate that, my brother. And that's what we have to understand that complaining. And a lot of times we don't see again, complaining as sin, but you see, it doesn't please the Lord. Uh, and so we have to be ever, ever mindful of that. Uh, Sister Thomasina. Yes, ma'am. They were complaining, absolutely. Um, the last strike, they had, um, they complained against God 10 times and, and all of that, and they never trusted in God. And as a result, that's why you were in, um, uh, you know, you can, you can extend your stay in a trial. You can extend your stay. And so it's best to trust in God and wait on the Lord. But when you don't allow the trial to bring out the best in you, um, you can extend your stay in a trial. You can be in that trial a mighty long time. Um, so here they are thinking about, um, you know, dying of hunger. Now here's God saying, again, I'm going to test you. Verse number four, verse number four, really quickly. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I want, uh, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may what? Test them whether they will what walk in my law or not. So um, God said, you're complaining about hunger. God said, I'm going to take care of the hunger. But at the same time, I'm going to send you a, I'm going to give you instructions in terms of a certain quota. Uh, this is how much for all of you. Uh, and, and I'm doing that because I want to see if you're going to behave if you're going to walk according to my law. And so he gives them uh, this instruction. And, and, and one of the things we see a whole lot in that, I wish I had time to go through it, but um, they would gather up the bread early in the morning, um, but they were not to gather none on, uh, what is that, the Sabbath day. Um, but they were to gather um, a double portion before the Sabbath day so that on the Sabbath day, they had enough and then some. But for those that did not obey God and, and took more than they should have taken, uh, the Bible says, uh, let me see here. Oh, yes. Verse number 20. Verse number 20. Uh, the Bible says, notwithstanding, uh, they did not heed Moses, which means they didn't heed the Lord. Uh, but some of them left part of it until morning and it bred worms and stank and Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when uh, the sun became hot, it melted. And so God gave them instructions and here they are again being tested and failing the test. You have to decide uh, in your mind. And what's interesting is the power of a decision. When you say, I'm not going to do this thing today and you commit your way to the Lord and say, you know what? I don't care what happened. I'm not going to go to them cigarettes. I'm not going to go to that bottle. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. I I'm not going to do that today. I don't care what happened. I'm not going to do it. The power of a decision will enable you to walk past what, uh, what you struggle with. And so what we have to decide to do in our life is to choose God, uh, choose to trust him. Uh, choose not to fail the test again. Sometimes as a child of God, you get frustrated with yourself because you're tested time and time again and time and time again, you keep failing. Just decide you want to win. That's all you have to do is decide I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to be better today than I was yesterday. Make a decision and watch God through the Holy Spirit give you the strength to see your convictions through. And that's very important for us to understand. So they were being tested. Now, uh, how are we doing? Oh, time's up. Okay, now, on next week, Lord willing and life last, we'll begin at chapter number 17. I was hoping that we get through 19. I think we did pretty good on tonight. I hope that something was said uh, to encourage us, strengthen us, uh, that we can apply to our lives today um, because uh, the Bible lets us know that there's no new thing under the sun. Same people then are the same people today. 
And so oftentimes when we read the, the Bible, you see yourself uh, exemplified in, in, in people uh, that are very much like the same people that are living today just in contemporary times. So again, it is our prayer that you've been edified on tonight. Continue to study God's word. Oh, also, uh, if you are interested, um, just text me. Uh, I didn't get a chance to really flesh out chapter number 14, uh, but I outlined and I did a, a, a lesson, about five pages, um, a strong lesson um, on uh, chapter number 14. I can't even remember what I called that lesson. Uh, oh yes, depending on God, depending on God. Now, if you're interested in that lesson, uh, text me. And, uh, and if, if I have your email address, then I can send it to you. Um, and so, uh, I think it's very good for the church because, uh, we need to depend on the Lord more. If, if we don't get nothing else out of, uh, the children of Israel and what they were going through, and the test that they failed is because they failed to depend on God. And so last time I said, if you're interested in it, I'll email it to you tonight. May it edify your spirit and your soul. Thank those for, who are with us on Facebook. Lord willing, life last. We will see you on uh, this coming Lord's Day as we magnify the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. So God bless, strengthen, and keep you. Amen. <laughs>